Here I am, another day forward on my path to becoming a gray Jedi. In December 2015, Mark Bullard felt on top of the world, referring to himself as a powerful Star Wars character. He had landed a good job in Denver after graduating magna cum laude from Southern Methodist University earlier in the year. It's been a good year. He made video diaries to keep his family and friends updated on his life. I've been finding a bit of stability. Mark was looking forward to an even better 2016. It's time to start planting projects, to start planting seeds. I'm gonna be a hell of a farmer by the time this is done. <laughs> but just four months later, in April 2016, Mark Bullard took his own life. One month after he recorded this video, Mark's written diary shows severe depression seems to have taken hold of him. Yet neither his friends nor family were aware of it. And the diary details no triggering event. But what he did not tell his parents is that he was inhaling an extremely concentrated form of THC, the psychoactive drug in marijuana. It is known as dabbing. December, he's fine. He comes home for Christmas holidays. He's here. And what we saw in the, in the diary later was by January the 16th, I guess, he's talking about suicide. Hi, I'm John Ferrugia. Welcome to Insight, the first of our special reports on important issues facing our community and our state. Tonight, marijuana in Colorado, the state of high. Mark Bullard's suicide is a glimpse into what some advocates say are the risks of Colorado's legalization of marijuana. We're going to look more closely into his case, what we know and don't know about THC, as other states are now considering legalization of medical and recreational cannabis. But first, how we got here. Recreational sales began January 1, 2014. The issue was never debated in the legislature or voted on by a majority of legislators and signed into law by the governor. Instead, the sale of legal cannabis was enshrined in the state constitution as the will of the people when voters passed Amendment 64 in 2012. That presented a number of challenges, including creating a set of rules and regulations to govern all aspects of production and sale of recreational cannabis. We grow all of our flour. We make all of our own concentrates. The rules needed to be formulated from scratch, and they had to be in the books in just months to give stakeholders, that is pot shops, regulators, growers, law enforcement, and the public, enough time to prepare for January 1st, 2014. We've tested every single product that we've either created or grown um, from day one. What we found is that the rules and regulations of legalized marijuana in Colorado have been playing a game of catch up ever since, resulting in what critics say are sometimes deadly consequences. Mark Bullard grew up in Texas, where he was valedictorian of his high school class. He was always busy. His parents, Mike and Jenny, remember a precocious kid. He was always involved in the drama, the productions. Uh, the one act. Marvelous, marvelous, marvelous. He was an entertainer, yeah. yes, he was. He loved travel. He was just, you know, a well-rounded kid. And he kept diaries. In one entry, Mark noted he tried marijuana, maybe for the first time, his parents aren't sure, while on spring break his senior year in college. I had the mindset, well, it's just marijuana. It's not going to hurt anything. It's No one's ever died from it. Even before Mark graduated from SMU in May of 2015, he had landed a job in Denver working for a prestigious consulting firm. He did love the beauty and the nature of Colorado. He liked the Rocky Mountains. I'm finding that the more that I look, the more goals I've achieved. It's been a good year. Mark recorded this video diary on December 9th last year, just before returning home to Texas to celebrate Christmas with his family. He just felt that he'd done more than he maybe even expected to, but yet he still had a lot of expectations for the coming year. And 2016? 2016 is a year of something new. But after spending the holidays with his family and returning to Colorado, Mark's high hopes and expectations for 2016 seemed to have quickly faded, and his diary entries began to take an ominous tone. So he just went very fast from where he was positive, looking forward to the next year, to where he's, you know, I'm thinking about my suicide, uh, and, and then it just got worse. Mark had never previously shown any signs of depression or mental illness. It was only after his surprising suicide in April 2016 that his parents got to read his diaries. By February, he's writing suicide notes and February, the end of February, doing suicide notes, tearing them out and making annotations on his, in his diary. These were, these torn out pages were practice suicide notes. 
Mike and Jenny pored over Mark's entries, searching for answers. What could be the triggering event? When did you first see the first entry about dabbing? That was in the March the 5th, and that's where he talks about, you know, uh, I think I've been dabbing too much. Dabbing. Mike and Jenny had never heard of it. For the uninitiated, dabbing is a way to smoke a potent form of highly concentrated THC, the active ingredient in marijuana. It's known as wax, shatter, and honey. It gives the rush of an instant high. And in Colorado, where recreational marijuana is legal, there are no limits on THC concentration levels in a dab. Dabbing was becoming part of a subculture looking for an ever-increasing THC high. Yes, we'd heard that marijuana was legal, but we're thinking about people smoking cigarettes. This is a very potent marijuana concentrate. And some people have told us that the THC levels are 80 to 90 percent. We had no idea that this was something that was legal in Colorado. Not only is high potency THC legal in Colorado, there has been an ever increasing effort to extract THC in its purest form. The sophistication in labs like this is so high that we can achieve near perfect purity, 98%, 99% THC or CBD or any cannabinoid that we're, that we're isolating and extracting uh, to the crystalline form. Ralph Morgan is the CEO of Organa Labs, a company that extracts THC from marijuana for use in a smoking device. His solution, used by consumers, is almost 90% pure THC. The industry is chasing purity for the, the benefits of that. Those benefits are a product that's repeatable, that's safe, and has a, uh, an effect that's consistent. With purity comes potency. While Morgan and others in the industry provide an ever purer product and high potency, it is not their job to worry about how much consumers use or how they use it nor is it their responsibility under Colorado law. Even so, the industry knows that adverse reactions are bad for business. Cannabis is, is very safe, but it's not foolproof. And no one's, going to, no, one's, no one's going to defend not exercising moderation. And anything in life can, can fog your judgment or it can be detrimental if it's not done in moderation. I just feel like he was gripped by the substance yeah. And it took over his mind. I know this is one of his later writings too, and he talked about that he knew that his brain was damaged, but he doesn't know why. Basically nothing makes me happy and I have no idea w which direction to go to change that. Where in the hell has my mind gone? Can you help me? I think I'm lost. Jenny and Mike point to Mark Bullard's own words in his diary, indicating that he was suffering from a dabbing addiction. I found out that maybe, you know, I was dabbing um, too, too much. much which I already knew, and I had cut back in February. But apparently, if you, if you overdo it, you can get almost like poisoned and only experience the negative effects. A lot of people say, oh, there's no downsides of THC. Well, there are. Dr. Carrie Franzen is Associate Dean at the University of Colorado School of Pharmacy, and she's been studying cannabis for years, including human studies in the Netherlands where marijuana consumption was legal long before Colorado. People have said, well, you know, you can't get addicted to marijuana. Oh, you can. Oh, definitely you can. But it's because marijuana works and stimulates dopamine in this part of our brain that we call the reward center. In the case of 23-year-old Mark Bullard, the certificate of death lists a contributing factor as use of concentrated marijuana products. And the autopsy report showed high levels of active THC in his body. I believe the dabbing, the dabbing caused the depression because I think, and I think the withdrawals were all part of, I think he did try to cut back and try to reduce the amount. He says that. He says that, in, that he did, he tried cutting back. We see studies with chronic users that lead to depression and we see chronic users that think it treats their depression. Both studies exist. So how are we as a society to judge Gosh, what do we know that's happening? We don't know. I personally think when people vote for marijuana being legal, they're thinking, oh, it's just a little marijuana cigarette. And, and that's what they're being told and that's what they think is gonna happen. But then there's this other can of worms on the other side where it's, it's much more serious problem with the concentrated products. Do we know 100% sure that it was a dabbing? No, we can't, like, like we talked about, you can't say that it's 100% sure. Had we not had the journals, 
um, and some of the, the, the videos, it, we probably still would be asking why. But after reading through these and seeing the significant changes in his patterns, this is the only thing that, it, it, that we feel it points to, is yeah. the dabbing. While there are many unanswered questions about Mark Bullard's suicide, the circumstance surrounding the death of 16-year-old Chad Britton, a student at Broomfield High School, is far clearer. I just heard like this loud crash, like I've never heard anything like that. Uh, this was, uh, it went homecoming weekend. Megan Cruz was Chad Britton's girlfriend. They were on a lunch break from classes, his car parked on a public street near the school. She was getting into the passenger side of the car. He was reaching into the back seat on the driver's side. I like looked up and I could see his lunch like falling down. I'm like screaming his name and I was like, Chad, Chad, like where are you? And I wasn't getting a response back. So I walked on that side and I uh, looked in the middle of the street and he was under a car, uh, like a trailer of a truck. And I, I've never seen anything like it. So I thought he could hear me. I just told him I loved him. I was like, I love you so much. Like, it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. That's all I kept saying. But Chad didn't make it. He was pronounced dead at the hospital. His organs were donated. He would make you smile. And his family says that was in keeping with his generous spirit. He was just fun and kind. We lost him and all of his, our hopes and dreams for him. Chad Britton's family, his father Lonnie, who raised him as a single dad, his grandmother and his uncle are still remembering his life almost two years after he was run down by a teenage driver who police say was dabbing high potency THC just prior to the 2014 accident. Brandon Cullop was 17 at the time of the accident. He had only had his driving permit for a week. His friends in the car told him he was too high to drive, but that didn't stop him. Cullop pleaded guilty to vehicular homicide and reckless driving and is serving a two-year sentence in youth corrections. He was with me wherever I went. He was my right-hand man. My, he's just, I loved him to death. He had a great sense of humor. And he was smooth as glass with girls. He was so much fun. And he could skate like a madman. At the skate park, at school, even at a local Broomfield fast food store, Chad Britton had so many friends, and they all came to pay their respects. There was probably a thousand people at the skate park, and probably a thousand people at his wake. I look at it as like where I feel closest to him. So it's, it's more comforting than sad, I guess. Chad Britton is one of 36 people who died in 2014 in automobile accidents that the Colorado Department of Transportation attributed to fatalities where THC was the only substance inhibiting the driver. 2014 is the year marijuana was legalized for recreational use. Now that's compared to 107 people who died that year in alcohol-only crashes. The percentage of marijuana-only fatalities is small, but has been edging up since 2013. Before, I've seen kids who just used to like go smoke at lunch and then drive back to school, and like I never thought, I, had, I really had to look into it to realize that it doesn't pair you. The risk of minors getting their hands on pot has been front and center even before passage of Amendment 64. The laws regulating retail marijuana specifically ban minors from buying, using, or possessing cannabis products. Yet kids do and the results can be devastating. This wax, or whatever the hell it is, where does it fit into the picture? It never has made sense to me. I have no idea how long it would take me to get rid of a milligram of marijuana, or THC. No. That's because those who study cannabis say it affects each person differently. Low doses of THC, we know what happens. Increasingly, um, increasing doses of THC, we know what happens. These super high concentrations of THC, we don't know what happens because we have not been studying it. When they smoke that, they're getting in the 600 to 800 milligrams of THC. Six to 800. Six to 800 milligrams. It's it, quite a difference. That's compared to a limit of 10 milligrams in each serving of an edible in Colorado, or maybe 25 milligrams of THC in a typical marijuana cigarette. Dabbing is, has become um, very popular very quickly, and, and nobody's been able to look at dabbers and, their, um, and publish any results because it's just, it's too new. 
So nobody knows. Nobody knows. People have, have, have jumped into this feet first very quickly without any kind of understanding how much is actually getting into the brain and what are the, the effects of a typical user. It's just very difficult to study what the true impacts are when you're dealing with all these different levels of potency. Dr. Larry Wolk is director of the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. His agency is tasked with ensuring marijuana products are safe for consumption. The credible research that exists was all done on THC potency that's very low compared to what we see being made available through products today. Wolk says the high-potency cannabis products available in Colorado have far outpaced the rules the federal government has set for study. The Drug Enforcement Administration classifies marijuana as a Schedule I drug, allowing research on a very limited basis. Some of our studies that we funded here in Colorado are a year or even two years delayed as a result of just trying to get through this federal morass. So you, you, you can't get the high-potency uh, product to test? Um, you can, but it's taking a lot of work and a lot of time. It's not allowed in, in the standard uh, FDA-approved labs. Uh, it's not allowed for academic institutions to research it. Kayvon Kalitbari is a founder of Denver Relief Consulting. He advises marijuana businesses across the country and is a board member of the Council on Responsible Cannabis Regulation. He says the cannabis industry is in favor of detailed studies. I would simply like to see a very unbiased, fair study so we can really put this to bed, uh, or if we find some things out that we didn't know, address them appropriately. Wolk says until studies are completed, he favors limiting potency. It makes a lot more sense from a health standpoint and from a research standpoint to say, let's make everything the same at least to start. Let's have everything be 10 milligrams or whatever the strength should be. But Kalitvari says that is an unrealistic limit for all cannabis products. Why should we let the, the prohibition of cannabis continue to thwart the progress of cannabis? I don't think that we've seen anything happen in society in the last two years that would indicate that this is a massive problem that we need to roll back on. People have been using concentrates for a long time. We have not seen any evidence of high, high potency concentrates in the cannabis world doing anything of, of that grand or negative impact. But that is little consolation for Lonnie Britton. You can't even put any kind of chips or drink into your body that doesn't have how much sodium, how much sugar, anything in it. Uh, but you could just sell this wax with no regulation on it whatsoever. It's ridiculous. Hi, my name is Peyton. She was riding in front of me. And I always had her right in front of me so that I could see where she was. She had the crosswalk, the light, and so she went. The truck took off from where it was and hit her and ran her over. Just before school let out for summer vacation earlier this year, Cody Shetley witnessed the death of his eight-year-old stepdaughter, Peyton. As it was happening, I was yelling, no, no, no. I threw my bike down and ran out into the street. And she was lying there motionless. She was gone. I didn't want to tell Mindy on the phone, but I knew. the blank look on her face. I knew she was gone. They told us later that it was instant and I already knew. Peyton was pronounced dead at the hospital. When Peyton came down from the top bunk, she made me happy. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, you like when she got up in the morning? <laughs> yeah, it made me happy. It made you happy. Peyton left behind her younger sister, Skylar, who, along with her family, continues to grieve and to remember. She lived every moment of life. Mindy is Peyton's mother. She had a lot of energy, um, very caring. She was, she was a natural mother. She just kind of took everybody under her wing, no matter who you were or what age you were. You were, if you were nice to her, you were instantly her best friend. Kyle Couch was driving the truck that hit Peyton. Longmont police records show officers at the scene of the accident noticed his vehicle smelled of marijuana. 
When asked if he was under the influence, Couch told police he was not. They asked Couch if they could draw blood at the scene. He refused, but then consented to a series of sobriety tests. Based on the results, officers felt he was impaired. They had probable cause to detain him. They told us that he was being charged with uh, driving under the influence of marijuana and that he was being charged with vehicular homicide. Couch was just 20 years old at the time of the accident. He had a fake ID. His case is a glaring example of what critics say is one of their biggest concerns about legalization, access by minors. And industry representatives say they share that concern. I don't want children to have access to marijuana either. This entire facility is all hydroponics. Tim Cullen is the CEO of Colorado Harvest Company. This is where everything starts. One of the state's largest marijuana growers. I think the entire process and how it's set up now where you have to be 21 to enter the store, products are sold in child resistant containers. At some point, that responsibility ends with the, the manufacturer and picks back up with the parents. A Healthy Kids Colorado survey with data ending in 2015 shows use among high school students has remained relatively unchanged and is trending down since recreational cannabis was legalized. 2016 data is not yet available. In 2009, 43% of Colorado's high school students said they had tried marijuana at least once. And in 2015, 38% said they had experimented. In 2015, four out of five, 78% of high school students said they had not used marijuana in the last 30 days. And in what may come as a surprise to many, the percentage of Colorado's high schoolers who said they currently use marijuana is slightly less than the national average. These are sort of middle age in their prime, really healthy. Tim Cullen believes the cooperative education program between the industry and the state health department called the Good to Know campaign is effective in reaching parents focusing on youth prevention. If you choose to use, don't drive high. I really think the Good to Know campaign that's being funded by marijuana tax dollars is doing a really good job with active campaigns about drinking and driving, about drug use and driving, about marijuana consumption and youth. Just remember, you got to be 21. That's to have and to hold and to buy and to use. While Brandon Couch was underage, his blood test, taken more than two hours after the accident that killed eight-year-old Peyton Knowles, showed 1.5 nanograms of active THC per milliliter of his blood. That is well below the legal standard for marijuana impairment in Colorado, which is five nanograms of THC per milliliter. Yet detectives deemed him to be impaired at the scene. He was charged with driving under the influence of drugs and illegal possession of marijuana by a minor. I'm disappointed that the five nanogram concentration um, is in law because it doesn't mean anything because we're all different and how we react to marijuana is very different. Dr. Carrie Franzen of the CU School of Pharmacy says impairment depends on an individual's THC tolerance, not a five nanogram standard. If you're taking the serum concentration or the blood sample a couple hours afterwards, the person will not have the same concentration. So we should only be using the person's on the scene's assessment of the person's impairment not looking at a serum concentration or blood concentration of the THC. So essentially you're saying that if somebody has an accident and they may at that time be way above five. Five nanograms, right? yes. And if they're two hours later, they're tested, they don't have that. Anymore. They might not have that, exactly. They will seem like they're not impaired. But the five nanogram standard is a baseline agreed upon by the industry and the state as a level where the casual marijuana user may become impaired. From our perspective, there's really no safe amount that could be consumed that would allow us to say, oh, as long as you consume X amount, it's okay for you to operate a vehicle. There's no gauge, we have no research to really sort of help give us a barometer for what the level of impairment could be, should be, or is even expected to be. The real thing that people need to know and that a lot of people don't understand is that marijuana impairs you, period. I have known a lot of people who smoke pot who said, oh, I don't, I'm not a bad driver when I'm on pot. Yes, you are. The Colorado State Legislature is so concerned about public health and safety, it has now appropriated millions of dollars to study the mental and physical effects of high-potency dabbing, the effects of marijuana on pregnant women and unborn children, and the use of marijuana by teens, just to name a few.
We don't have any data to say, you know, well, if it's a higher percentage or a higher milligram of THC, uh, does that have higher or more risk implications tied to that higher potency? And State Health Department Chief Dr. Larry Wolk says with marijuana legalization sweeping the country, there is a sense of urgency. We don't know what the long-term impact or long-term effects are. Whatever we can do as an industry to keep the progress of the industry moving forward, but also be considerate of these perceived fears that people have, I think that that's very reasonable. While Kayvon Kalidbari believes THC, even in concentrates, is safe, he supports studies to prove it. Uh, the more knowledge we can have about this, this substance uh, in its many forms and, and how it relates to, to humans in all different forms and the physical and mental and emotional differences uh, that they have, uh, it, of course that's important. Everybody thinks it's innocent, you know, just it's going to relax people, it's going to make them mellow, it's not going to do any danger to them. I think there needs to be more accountability and not just with the manufacturers, I think with the legislators, and I think the voters really need to consider this as well when they, when they go to the ballot box. In nine states, voters are going to the polls to decide on legalization of pot. And in Colorado, seven municipalities or counties will consider whether THC products can be sold in their jurisdiction. In making that decision, we hope we've helped voters understand what we don't know about a potent and complex drug that is now legal in Colorado. That's our insight for tonight. I'm John Ferrugia. Thanks for joining us. Good night.